Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Leila Tamia and I'm the president at JMSU. We're really, really pleased to be joined here by our vice chancellor, Professor Ian Campbell, who has kindly agreed to take part in the event today, answering your questions. Hearing from my officer colleagues across the UK, I know that there aren't many VCs who would meet students face to face in an opportunity like this. So I'd just like to thank Ian for taking the time to do this this evening. This is a great opportunity for Ian from, to hear from you, but for you to also hear directly from the university on the challenges that they've faced during the pandemic and the adaptations that they've made. Before we start, I am just going to go through the plan of the event and obviously the boring Zoom etiquette stuff. So we have collated a number of questions in advance and we'll be asking Ian for his perspective on these. If time allows, we will have the opportunity for you to ask any follow up questions. Um, so please do wait until the end or raise your virtual hand until we invite you to speak. In addition, you are welcome to use the Q&A function in order to ask your question. If you would like to comment on a question asked or respond to any questions raised by myself or Ian, then we would like you to just use the chat function to do that, please. This has been a difficult year for everyone, for both staff, students. I mean, we've all been through our ups and downs, not just in our professional or educational lives, but at home and in our personal lives too. We just ask if you please remain respectful to everyone on the call. And if you don't get the opportunity to have your question answered today, we're gonna to follow up with the VC after this to um, maybe release some further um, guidance or um, a response document where appropriate. Since March, COVID has made a huge impact on the student experience with the move to online teaching. Students, of course, have had a lot of questions the reason why I wanted to hold this call is to bring the student voice direct to the university, to give students the opportunity to hear from the university firsthand themselves. As officers, we engage in these conversations with the university daily, sharing your feedback, concerns, and asking people like the vice chancellor directly some of the questions that you might have. In addition, we know the coming months will be equally challenging, so we are keen to hear and share all the learning from semester one to prepare for semester two. Often it is difficult as your student officers to convey the decisions that directly affect you. Um, there are times where we might not always agree with the university. However, it is often easier for us to understand because we're in the room when those decisions are being kind of debated and discussed. Um, we truly hope that this event can give you a deeper understanding about those decisions and um, that have been made over this current situation and the challenges the university have faced in trying to maintain the great student experience whilst also trying to keep the health and safety of its students and staff its number one priority. This year continues to be tough, complex and ever-changing. It would be remiss of me not to recognise all the people and the hours taken by the university to respond to the pandemic and start of term, even in a virtual world. No decision was taken lightly and I know that they were made with the best intentions when faced with the guidance provided at the time. I must also recognise the immense effort and commitment students have made, whether that be engaging with online teaching, volunteering, um, to help other students in, in self-isolation, reaching out to us via the JMSU Hangout or other social media, um, or to those students who've been struggling um, with loneliness and the efforts that our student groups have gone to to ensure that their members are, I guess, still able to engage with one another. We've all truly been blown away with the way that you've responded to such a difficult period and we're really, really proud of you all. Since COVID, JMSU have worked on a number of initiatives to support students. From the start all the way back to March, we helped lobby for a no detriment policy and supported students who wanted to leave their accommodation early. We have seen over 788 students through our advice service. We've put on over 269 online events introduced our isolation support volunteers and even our buddy scheme to help students in the city make friends. We have launched our brand new volunteering platform and offered virtual volunteering opportunities, recognizing students that are volunteering in the local community. We've elected our amazing new part-time officers and NUS delegates. We've introduced our brilliant faculty representatives. We've enrolled over 500 course reps so far and helped over um, 14 new students get set up, student groups get set up. Our VP activities, Emily, has got our, student active, got our students active and released the 10 week challenge and weekly workouts for students to stay active and to explore Liverpool in a socially distanced way. Last month, we launched our Black History Month campaign and even now we're in the midst of November where we've seen over 4,000 pound raised for charity by our amazing student groups. 
We're so immensely proud of all the work our student groups have continued to do and how they've reacted to providing their activity online for members throughout the pandemic. The action student groups have taken to respond to this crisis has laid the groundwork for recovery and we will see this thrive into term two activity, no doubt. When faced with, with the continued uncertainty, our student leaders have played a critical role in guiding our students through uncharted waters and we thank them all for all the work that they've done so far this year. Coming to the rest of the academic year, we will launch our student groups and our student council, finding better ways to represent you. Collectively, over the last few months, the office team have signed hundreds of meetings advocating for you, trying to minimise the impact of coronavirus on your education. None of this would have been possible without you, our students, sharing your experience and engaging with us. In response to what you, our members, have been telling us, we launched our It's Not Good Enough campaign. This wasn't a direct attack on the university, who've been placed between a rock and a hard place, but is an acknowledgement of what you're experiencing right now. It is a campaign to highlight all the different aspects where we feel the government has let you and the universities down. We would be remiss of our, in our role if we didn't amplify your voice when you are telling us something isn't working for you. The government can make a difference. They can work better with institutions and with NUS. They can offer support packages for students. They can help mitigate the impact of employment opportunities. They can work with the accommodation centre to ensure both landlords and tenants don't miss out. And of course, they can ensure that students aren't scapegoats and are viewed as adults and citizens when it comes to their role in the pandemic. Before I do hand over to the VC, I did want to say that I know many students, not just here, but across the country are disappointed and angry because of the impact on their education hopes for the future caused by COVID. It has robbed you of your precious time and experiences that stand out greatly. And there's no one more equally disappointed than those that are here to help you through your journey and the university community. Um, so I'd just like to ask the Vice Chancellor now um, if he'd like to say a few words and in maybe introduce himself now as well. Well, thank you, Leila, and uh, I guess it's follow that, isn't it? I mean, that was fantastic. Thank you for, for actually that introduction. It was, it was terrific to listen to. I think uh, the first thing I, I'd want to say is uh, thank you for inviting me along to this town hall event. And I appreciate everybody who has taken the time out of their day to be here to um, engage with things that are really important with them. And I'm as keen as anybody to listen to any comments that you have. Indeed questions, yes, of course, but also the comments and your narrative is important for me to understand as the VC uh, in terms of your experience at LJMU. Because um, whether you believe this or not, I am absolutely passionate about students and the student experience. I have been, it's the reason I'm in education, higher education. Uh, Leila said, introduce myself, I forgot that bit. So I am actually, uh, lots of people call me the, the vice chancellor, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm Ian, um, you know, and the bottom line for me is, uh, by all means, if you want to call me vice chancellor, that's fine. But at the end of the day, um, I'm like you. I'm a person and I'm Ian. Um, for me, uh, I, I think what I would like to also say is I don't underestimate the challenges that all of you have been going through. And I think this Zoom call is probably demonstration of that in some ways. Is I can't see any of you at this moment in time. What I know is there's about 76 people in the room which is brilliant, um, but I can't see any of you. That's a shame. I much prefer to be uh, face to face and I'd welcome the opportunity at some point to, to do that. Um, I, I will say a few words, if you don't mind, just in terms of from um, a perspective. And I'm going to go back in time to come forward a little bit the way that Layla did. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd start with, if you'd gone back a year and you said to me, Ian, in the next year, what you're going to experience is a global pandemic that is going to impact on global society and everybody within it. I would honestly have not believed you. And the second thing I probably uh, wouldn't have believed that the most frequent sentence that I would have heard during all of that time since the pandemic is, Ian, you're on mute. And if you'd said that to me a year ago, I wouldn't have believed you either.
but we are in a pandemic and it is impacting on us all in, in very different ways, um, some in more ways than others. Um, but for me, I think it's important that you understand what we as a university were doing, have done and where we're going. And the first bit about that was actually about protection and protection of our students and staff and trying to ensure that they were safe during that period where we went into lockdown on the first occasion. And that was our focus. And then the focus became very much how do we get all our students to the end of the, the academic year in a way that is successful yet different from, um, from normal. And uh, I actually want to acknowledge both the students and the staff and the way they responded to that situation. It was quite phenomenal and I want to applaud what JMSU, Leila at that time, um, in terms of Julia when she was president, I want to acknowledge the work that went on then in not just the support that, that JMSU gave us, also the challenge because of the result of that challenge that came from you as students or indeed from the J, JMSU itself, we changed what we were doing as a result of that. And one example of that would be the no detriment policy. So I thank you for already for what happened there. In addition to that, what happened next was very much a case of going, how do we get ready for the start of the academic year that we're currently in, trying to ensure that we were in the best place possible to um, have our students come back to campus in a safe way in order for them to engage in activities which we thought would be in a normal way, i.e. face to face, knowing at the same time things could be very different and also preparing for that and that's what we did and um, I have to say it was similar for every university and um, from our perspective I think what uh, through us in many ways was the increase in particular within Liverpool that took us into a particular place and as three universities in line with the government in line with public health and in line with everything that we were being told we had to essentially move into that tier three and move to predominantly online uh, provision and for us ideally of course we'd want to be face to face but we can't be and then um, again what we feel that we did pretty well was actually move um, over the summer into a situation where we we did that successfully and now we're in a place of trying to deliver in this very very strange world and responding uh, literally every day to things that are going on and i would say this um, what i think that we've been really good at doing and we have to continue doing is firstly working with the situ situation every single day and adapting and responding to whatever the situation is and we are consistently listening every day to everything that comes our way from whatever uh, forum that is whether that be the government whether it be students whether it be staff whether it be public health england wherever it may be come from and that's sometimes required us to respond in the moment within an hour of a particular announcement and so we will continue to listen we will continue to respond we will continue to adapt and um, we know that we will get through this in a, a meaningful way uh, in, that, in that respect and so actually I also look forward to kind of getting into a situation where it is um, back to some sort of normality I think though what I will do is because what I want to hear is um, and talk about the questions that you've got uh, and also uh, to listen to your commentary about your experience at Liverpool John Moores and being part of our fantastic community. I think I'll stop there Leila if that's all right. Thank you Ian, that's great. Um, if you're happy we can jump straight into the questions. I mean um, I maybe forgot to mention earlier but we are recording the event so um, students, if you would like to ask your question a bit later on, just um, know that we are recording and uh, if you're not comfortable with that, you can um, just let us know, uh, maybe in your question. So without further ado, um, I guess we can start off with the questions that we had um, sent in previously. So we've organized these into topics. So um, just to give you all an overview before, 
as I know we've already had questions coming in that will be covered shortly, but we've got questions around tuition fees, around international students, around online teaching, mental health support, the laptop scheme, graduation, sport, um, communication, and uh, a lot more. So um, of course, the biggest topic that students want to hear about is tuition fees. So um, I'd just like to start off, um, Vice Chancellor, if I could ask, um, students feel they are getting a decreased uh, quality of teaching and learning and reduced face-to-face -face support. So um, students have said, how can the university justify still charging students £9,000? Okay, thank you, Leila. So the first thing I would accept is that, the, that students have got a very different experience to what they were expecting. And I, I suppose I'll go back to statement that I made earlier on that in an ideal world we would all be uh, face to face um, and operating in what would be regarded as a traditional way just as you know if you take Freshers Week as the example having to do everything virtually was far from ideal but necessary given the circumstances that we found ourselves in. I think what's really important to understand is that staff uh, whether that be our academic staff or our support services staff are working just as hard in terms of what they have to deliver although that's in a very different way to the way they would have normally done so so there's been no change in terms of the amount of um, ac academic input and effort to deliver a quality experience to the students and that also applies from our student support services as well and indeed, some people would suggest that actually there's more effort going in, given the changes that occurred and given everything that our students are going through at this moment in time. In addition to that, of course, what we are doing is investing more in terms of our support for students, in terms of our IT provision to try and ensure that the uh, experience students are getting is, is fit for purpose. And in addition to that, we put in various schemes, such as the laptop scheme that you mentioned, to support students, as well as our additional hardship funds. So from all of those particular points of view, that we feel that the fee that we are, um, that exists, um, is actually appropriate. And actually, we've had no contrary advice from the government in relation to that. So we have no intention of changing our current fee regime. So I do recognise it's a different experience, but not necessarily one of lesser quality. And thank you for that, Ian. So on the back of that, then, obviously, students are asking, um, you know, they, they'd like a partial refund and they'd, they'd like to understand why um, they're, they're not given a partial refund. Um, they're not given what, Leila? Sorry. A partial refund as a result of the move to online teaching. Um, they'd just like to understand potentially why not they're going to be given a, a partial refund. Okay, so it's, it's essentially what I, what I said. So basically, from our perspective, what we have done is our staff are still investing time in terms of preparing and delivering lectures, et cetera, et cetera, in order that our students gain um, the level of experience you would expect and achieving the learning outcomes associated with each of the modules and also the programs that students are engaged on and so from our perspective that's what we are trying to ensure that we are doing and in of course in relation to that we are investing upon in IT provision so that that side of things is also covered so from our perspective that's not a place that we are going to go we intend to stick with the fee regime that we have. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, so obviously, we can see that schools are back and you know they're still operating. And um, one student has asked, uh, "Why are we still online when the schools are back and the government have allowed?" Yep. So again, that's a, it's a fair, it's a fair. Of course, it's a, the. I mean, the previous question was a very fair question. I under, I absolutely understand it. I think in the first, our first priority, if you go back to what I said at the start, was is about keeping our students safe. OK, so I recognise that schools are back, primary schools, secondary schools, absolutely do. But, but what you'll be aware of is that secondary schools, many schools have had to close down again as a result of people having COVID 
19, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, from our perspective, what we felt in line with the advice from Public Health Liverpool is that from all universities should be operating in the way that we are and indeed across the whole of the higher education sector the active blended learning approach that we've adopted and the way we are actually operating at the moment is deemed to be the best that in this light in the higher education and so we've just gone with those guidelines so that it fits with the government it fits with public health england it fits with liverpool in terms of the city region and the city and the situation it's in and we feel that's been the most appropriate way forward thank you ian uh, i hope that's provided some insight to that student who may be in the call um so we talked earlier around um the, the university doesn't intend um to kind of offer any pb funds or anything like that um one other one of the student has asked um will the university make any cost savings as a result of the online teaching and the move to online learning? Um, if so, how will this money be spent to improve the experience of students and will it be passed on or will it be passed on by a reduced tuition fees, which we've already discussed? Yeah, I can, I can kind of understand why people may think that going online is um, in some way less expensive um, in terms of doing, but if I, if I said to you, since the pandemic started roughly speaking to date we've spent five million more than we would have spent under normal situations and that's partially to do with um, our investment in IT to try and um, ensure that students are getting what they want from an online provision point of view it's partially because of some of the resources and support that we felt have been needed for students from a support perspective it's partially been due to um, things relating to ensuring that the environment our students were going to come back to was safe. And so for all those reasons, that's up to this point, it's cost us more than it would have normally done. Does that, does that make sense to you? So um, I can understand why, why the view might be, okay, have there been cost savings? It's actually been the reverse of that. It's cost us more at this moment in time. So um, I guess that's how I'd answer that particular question. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, I mean, I can understand why students might um, think that there may be some savings, but obviously being in the conversations myself, I have heard that figure of five million, which I too, to be fair, was quite astonished by. Um, so- Yeah, yeah. well, it, it's, and it's not, you know, it's, it really hasn't stopped there so that's that's at this moment in time and i do say that since since march so i'm not i'm not kind of going okay it's a result of just this semester i'm not saying that i'm saying since lockdown that is the amount of money broadly speaking at this moment in time we've spent and that figure is going up because what we recognize is the need for continuing to invest in support for students in whatever way that may, what that might look like. So let me kind of give you an example of it. Um, so we've, you will be aware that at the start of term, what we, what we had or what we intended was we em have employed lots of marshals to ensure that the environment students were coming into was going to remain safe and we were going to move people around to um, allow that to occur. What those marshals are now doing is supporting students within halls and elsewhere. And so all of that is vitally important, we think, to our student body and the experience and also ensuring that students feel safe within our institution. That's just kind of one example. There are many others of things that are, uh, that are happening, whether that be from a, a mental health perspective or anything else that we wish to talk about. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I'd just like to move on now to maybe the topic of international students. We've already had, um, I think, one or two questions already come through the Q&A on that. So I hope this might clarify um, it for the one that's already submit been submitted. So um, international students in particular do, do not feel like they're getting the experience or the support that they expected, given um, the significantly higher tuition fees and costs associated with being an international student, I guess, in general. Um, international students feel as if they are excluded from the narrative or discussions being hit by COVID 
Um, what measures have the university taken to ensure that international students still receive a quality education? Well, um, so I'm going to just, as I always do, I'm going to answer honestly, and there may be some additional thinking that I need to do as a result of this, this next comment. So we've always considered students in exactly the same way. So we regard, you know, there are lots of, lots of our student body who require support. And so whether that be um, an international student or somebody from Liverpool or the city region or from wherever, we felt that it's important to give all of our students an experience that is of quality. And so we like to think that we consider the needs of all, but perhaps as a result of the comments that, or the question that's come in, is that international students, obviously, I, I can't, I'm not looking at the Q&A at the moment, by the way, but basically, I, I, if, if something is, is going on there, from our perspective, actually, the way we viewed it to this point is all our students are one, they're all part of the LJMU community, as a result of that, what we're trying to do genuinely, whether that be from an academic perspective or indeed outside the course, we're trying to support our students in exactly the same way and trying to give the support that is required no matter where you come from. And that is very much how we've dealt with it. Now, if we've got that wrong as an institution and there's things that we should be doing that we're not doing, then of course we will give that further consideration. So I guess that's, um, that's something I would say back to you. I think there's a couple of other things I'd want to, to add into what I've said, um, possibly should have mentioned in this in the introduction or, or somewhere else. And obviously we've got a website that is dedicated to this pandemic and recommendations for staff and students. And within that, my understanding is that we do have a whole bunch of content or from an international student perspective that's designed to be as help and support. Now, obviously, obviously, as a result of this question, that isn't need, meeting the needs of international students. And I need to reflect upon that and think about how we might, um, might take things forward if we're not taking them forward in an appropriate way. And the other thing I would say is that within, um, I think it's important to understand this, I said about working with the situation every day and in, in every, um, every moment, if you like. And we've, we've had a, a helpline that's been operational now where students, staff, anybody can contact the helpline to ask questions, get advice. And from that, we're learning. And as a result of that, then we take forward action. So it's actually happening quite quickly in relation to that respect. So, um, I guess what I'm saying there, and every question that we do have that comes into us through that website, actually we, we respond to, but we're also learning from it. I mean, it would be ludicrous for me to say that we know all the answers. We, we, don't, we really don't. And actually what we are continually trying to do is work with everything that we come up against and actually go, you know what, that's a really great point. And by the way, there are rarely uh, points that are not great. They are, and actually cause me and others to think quite deeply about what we're doing. And please do understand that and appreciate it. Uh, and I would certainly okay. reflect on, um, I guess, the speed in which things are being reacted to, um, especially during COVID. I was in term for a few months before, and it took me months and months to pass something that would just take a few weeks here so students please do keep sharing your feedback with us and we will keep sharing it with the university um, to try and um, bring about some change where possible as well. Leila could you just repeat that because I just I missed it I'm sorry the, the no bit there where you said it is, is it taking us too long to respond? Is no, no, that no. What no no I was oh. saying quite the opposite I was saying during coronavirus uh, we have realized it has there have been much quicker responses to um, okay. I guess the impact of the pandemic that would have normally, due to the governance and things like that at the university, I think. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. Picked up Thank you. Thanks. I understand. Yes, great. Thank you. Great. So um, if it's okay with you, Vice Chancellor, um, we maybe want to take a live question in now um, just to respond to some of the ones that are coming in and then we'll cut back to the pre presenting questions. So yeah. um, we have had a question from, um, let's see. 
Um, Charlotte Halloway, um, would you like to unmute yourself? Um, if we can, whoever, Paul or Alistair in the background, if you could unmute, or, or Charlotte, if you would like to ask the question live, um, you're welcome to, but I can ask it for you if you would like. Um, of okay. course, Cameron. Um, hiya, so I was just wondering why we had to pay for accommodation for the first term when all of my face-to-face -face was actually cancelled before the term even began. Uh, Charlotte, I'm ever so sorry, but you broke up a little bit for me. I, what I caught was why are you having to pay for accommodation? That's, is, is, was that the question? Uh, yeah, basically, because all of my face-to-face -face was cancelled before the term even began so before i even had to move up okay so ju just to try and understand the uh, accommodation and the way it operates at, at liverpool john moores we don't have um we don't own any of our accommodation so the accommodation that we have is run by others we make recommendations to students as to the accommodation that they um, can uh, go to and actually have made what we've done is kind of vet various accommodation providers and yes suggested that these are the best uh, accommodation providers and therefore students should go to these particular um, providers so we don't actually have uh, anything to do with the accommodation providers so that's that, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but the, that's that's how it is at this moment in time. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm not sure if um, Charlotte um, is still on the line there, but um, please do type in the chat, Charlotte, if you would like any more clarification or anything like that. And um, we'll jump on to another um, pre-submitted, uh, another live question. So, Paul Gilhooley, would you like to um, unmute yourself? Um, or we'll get someone to unmute you, apologies. Um, we'll invite you to speak in a moment, if you would like. Hi, everyone hear me okay? Hi, Paul. Hi, and uh, it's just a follow up to the fees and the education quality issue. Um, there's many students unhappy about missing out on vital field trips and the hands-on experience that this gives for future employment. So how is the university hoping to counter that loss of experience via online teaching? Yeah, um, that's a great, um, it's a great, well, you, they're all great questions. So I, I don't know why I go, that's a great question, because actually they're all great questions. So uh, certainly you, you're quite right. Some of that, well, the field trip experiences are, something that we uh, is on our minds and how we deliver an equivalent experience given that actually it's not possible to undertake those field trip experiences and also what we absolutely recognize is that those experiences whether it be field trips or indeed placements internships work experience can then have a great impact in the ability to uh, gain employment and actually for the benefit of students can develop them in, in, a, in a way that um, puts them in a, a great position I think as they leave the institution and um, one of the things that we have we've already done and is is now kind of live is we've got a new employability uh, I don't like using university speak but employability strategy which is designed for me to basically provide students with the attributes with, that they need for later life. In other words, the skills that employers are looking for, and also not only from the course content that might come from field trips, but also the, so I always go kind of ready, ready for work, ready for life. That's been put in place and we've got a real focus on that at this, this moment and trying to work out how we, provide that equivalent experience, although in a different way, with the hope that things will return to some sort of normality going forward um, that allows people to undertake some of those experiences in, in a very real way. Thank you, Ian. 
Um, so moving on, I guess um, on the topic of online teaching, um, one question that's been pre-submitted says, um, Arts of Blended Learning was presented to students as an engaging and interactive academic experience. How would you reassure students from all courses who feel like they're experiencing a lacklustre pre-recorded lecture after pre-recorded lecture that the university is doing its best to promote high standards of teaching and learning and is endeavouring to improve and diversify modes of content delivery? Yeah. Well, uh, my first statement is I really do hope that that comment around lacklustre teaching and all the rest of it does not apply to all courses and all academic staff across the institution because for me what I know from some sessions I've been in is, is that's just not the case. Um, what I do uh, accept is that um, these are challenging times certainly to get, the, get all staff to a situation where they put everything online and um, allowed students to engage with their material in uh, some sort of meaningful way. Uh, we do have our teaching and learning academy that are working very closely and day by day with our academic staff to ensure that what is being provided is of quality and is engaging for students. But I do know um, from recent conversations that absolutely uh, isn't happening in uh, some situations. So in other words, I've had played back to me some things that I've found that I would regard as, as, in, as inappropriate. Um, and therefore I am taking action on that to ensure that um, where there is, for want of a better word, lacklustre um, experience, that that is, is not the case. I would say this in addition to that, there are an increasing number of universities who are going to what's termed the flipped classroom model, um, where actually the will be pre-recorded, and then actually the real engagement then happens within seminars and the discussion around that pre-recorded lecture can occur. Uh, what I do think, just, for, just from, actually I think that I have played back from me from, not necessarily from the question that's just been asked, but certainly as I've been engaging with other students, is that they actually um, quite like the active blended learning approach because they feel it gives them um, greater flexibility in the way they wish to operate and also uh, the online resources, um, I've had some positive feedback around that as well. So from my perspective, I don't think active blended learning is going away. I do recognize that as, and, I, as a, and I'm gonna say this, as a sector, we have to get better. So if you imagine you've moved from a traditional face-to-face -face, uh, delivery mode to deliver a learning experience into, a kind of online learning approach, there is a vast amount to learn. And let me kind of give you a kind of personal example. I don't know if it'll work for you, but for me, it kind of um, highlights something for me. So um, I've, I obviously, um, you know, I, my academic career, uh, uh, well, it had started like you as student, and I went through and enjoyed my, my um, the program of study that I was on, and then eventually I became a lecturer. Now, if you said to me that actually, did I enjoy um, lecturing and everything that went there? I absolutely did, and I loved face-to-face -face contact. Um, throughout my career, I've loved the energy that I get from students, and the reason that I'm in higher education is exactly because of that and because I want students to have a great experience. But if you said to me, Ian, I want you to deliver a session on physical activity and the benefits of it for mental health, I absolutely know I could deliver an engaging and inspirational um, session face to face, but may, given the change to Zoom, have challenges, at least initially, to be able to deliver that because I'm not as au fait with Zoom and how that operates, as I would have been had I been doing for the last 25 years, face-to-face -face teaching. So I think there is a bit about how lecturing staff, 
how academic staff adapt to this situation. And I think for the most part, academic staff have been brilliant, really engaged with it, recognising though that they have challenges and are wanting to do the best for their students. And the number of conversations I have from staff actually wanting to do that and wanting to get better at it is actually quite, um, quite a large number. Um, and from my perspective, they are committed to delivering the best experience online in a very different way to face to face. So I, I, next week I'm delivering a session, is it next week or the week after, the, the Board of Governors. It's a session that I would normally run, no problem at all. I know how I'd run it, I know what I do, I know exactly how I deliver. But in relation to the session I've got that I'm having to do online, I'm having to learn and go in, is this going to work? I don't know that it is, but I'm going to actually, I know it'll be a good session and they'll get the learning that they need from it. But is it going to be as good as me? I'd have a question mark against that. I hope that makes sense to you, but that's where I, I go with the answer to that, Leila. I feel like I've rambled on that, but hopefully there's something in it. No, not at all. It's kind of um, answered one of the follow-up questions which we've had pre-submitted. I'm going to just ask one more on online teaching um, and then invite another live question, another student to ask one of the live questions. So um, on the topic of kind of recorded lectures and uh, online learning, um, a dyslexic student has got in touch to ask why aren't lectures being recorded? Um, for students with dyslexia, university is hard, let alone online university. In the LJMU policy, it states it would be LJMU property. Therefore, tutors on the student's course have said that they don't want to in case they get replaced by these recordings next year. Right. Well, I mean, we, we are, from my perspective, we are recording um, lectures, pre-recording them, as the, as the previous question said. And from my perspective, I may have misunderstood it. What I can absolutely guarantee is students from any uh, background with any level of disability or um, what we're trying to do is provide for those students so if for some reason a dyslexic student is not getting what they need i need to explore that further but all the information i'd had is that we do actually a great job in relation to supporting our students so i, I would need to kind of understand a little bit more about that, Leila, and, and come back to you, I think. Thank you, Ian. It's just because we had uh, another one pre uh, in the live questions as well, I think. There may sure, have been sure. Where, I mean, um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not trivialising this at all. Um, from, from my perspective, if, this, if there are things that are not happening that, um, that disadvantage students, then from my perspective, I need to, I need to take that away and go, okay, so, understand it a little bit more. Up to this point, I thought that we were providing appropriate support for students in relation to that. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, we can certainly explore some of these outside the room as well. Um, so um, on to one of the live questions then. Um, we, since you were talking about sport earlier and physical activity, we have had one um, come through from Kyle Campbell Flynn. Um, Kyle, would you like us to invite you to speak? Um, I mean, we can't get a response there, sorry, but um, we will invite you to speak now if um, possible. Hi, Ian. Hi, Leila. You all right? Hi. Hi, Kyle. Great second name, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, which one do you want me to ask? The, the first one, the lack of stability one. Um, there was one around, um, should more funding be allocated for sports activities? Oh yeah, um, so the question was, uh, since COVID-19 has restricted sports for the first academic term, shouldn't more funding be allocated to sports slash activities to kickstart the new year? For instance, like members of groups are looking to the committee members to provide a service that warrants a membership fee. Uh, okay, so from the couple of things you need to go know, Kyle, is um, I'm absolutely passionate about sport and physical activity and um, recognize the positive impact that can have on any student so that's statement one statement two would be one of the main reasons that i um, went to university and it was a very important part of my life um, was sport and physical activity 
And um, I was reflecting on this only the other day, thinking, had I been in, you know, uh, your situation, how would I have felt? How would I have felt about not being able to be part of, uh, for me, it was the, the football, football team um, and many other societies as well. So I, I recognise the challenges that the situation has placed on, just as I do for students who are involved in the arts and culture, and that's what they're passionate about. I think what you've, um, what you've put forward, I do need to think about how we might consider that across sports. And uh, something that I have said to um, uh, Leila and, and to Paul Chapman as the CEO, of the uh, students, um, students' Union is essentially, I am quite happy to consider initiatives that do come from the Students' Union and um, that are important to our student body. And that, um, that offer is, is still there and then I will consider them quite, quite deeply. I don't know if that helps you, but that's, um, that's my response to it. Thank I really you. appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Ian. I didn't know you could still unmute. That's great. Thank you for that. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I think on the topic of sport, I might jump to one of the sport questions that have been pre-submitted. Um, why could Uni of Liverpool play sport before lockdown, um, but LJMU um, couldn't? Yeah. Um, so, I, th I think, um, again, I might have to just double check on this, but our, we we have an issue with our facilities that meant that well a, a lack of facilities if you like that didn't really allow us to um to allow the physical activity in sport to occur prior to lockdown whereas university of liverpool do have facilities what i am pleased to say i mean that's from one of the reasons that we are opening up the sports center in um Whenever it, whenever the date is that it opens up, but in a, in a short period of time. So with with any luck, I think it's March time. So that will change things. But it doesn't. And and I recognise what what people are saying is well, why are University of Liverpool able to do it, and why have we not been able to do it prior to the bit where we went into lockdown? When when I think actually Emily raised this with me um, quite early on, and I've gone. My answer to the question at that at that time was I don't know. So I guess that shows you, uh, you know, that I, I didn't understand at that time, but it relates to the fact we haven't got facilities and the University of Liverpool own their own facilities, if you like. So that's the answer, really. That's the honest answer to why we weren't opening up, because I can absolutely assure you, from my perspective, I guess repeating the answer I made to, to Kyle was that I, I absolutely recognise the importance of sport and physical activity and the conversation I had with Emily actually was how that can um, and, and it relates to societies as well how that can help with mental health and actually engaging with others so so I can assure you had it been possible to do I'd have been with you um, and, and wanting it to happen and um, you know I think what's important is as soon as we can I mean again I'm going to repeat myself you know, I, I'm a face-to-face -face person. I get energy from talking to people. I want people to be able to interact. I know the impact that can have on not just you, I know the impact it has on me. And without being able to interact with people in a reality, in, in real, for real, it, it can have, it really can have a big impact. I mean, I, I said to somebody the other day, I hope you don't mind me just going on a bit. It, doesn't quite link to your question but I, I said as a result of a you know a zoom call like this one I'd be able to see every everybody's face I might look around the room and go you know what I can see Layla doesn't feel quite uh, reassured by what I've just said there and at the end of the meeting what would happen if it was face to face I might be able to go up to Layla at the end of academic board that happened yesterday and say so What's going on? Is there something you weren't quite happy about? What happens now is that doesn't happen. So when this conversation, when our meeting finishes, then what I'll do is I'll press the leave button and I'll go straight to the fridge and have a look what I can eat instead of coming up to 
whether it be Kyle or Paul or Charlotte, who've asked really useful questions and saying, okay, how did you feel about that? So you lose a bit from this environment. And I therefore understand completely what sport and physical activity can do and the importance of that, and not just sport and physical activity, also societies and the arts and culture as well. Long-winded again, I know, Leila, apologies. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, that's fine. So, I mean, on the topic of mental health and um, kind of um, staying well, um, one student has submitted a question saying, university is overwhelming and students are usually able to socialise and to relax and get distracted from this. Um, we don't have that right now, so things are feeling really heavy. What is the university doing to support the mental health of students during lockdown? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what we have going on is, um, a, actually, it's a huge amount. I mean, one of the things that we've been very, very conscious about is uh, I, students could be very isolated at the moment, and I absolutely get that, and I understand the impact that that can have on people from, you know, and, and it, it, it's, it is a real, real big thing. And so as a result of that, you may be aware of, uh, Leila will be, of Yvonne Turnbull, who runs our student advice and wellbeing um, facility. Essentially, we've got lots more activities that students can engage with. Um, in terms of a program. We've also got additional resources in um, within accommodation trying to ensure that we connect with people who just need to have a one-to-one -one chat and to feel that somebody is there for them because actually they are. We've also got online services that we are um, that we've kind of invested into so some people don't necessarily want to connect face to face and would prefer to connect online and that's fine and so we've kind of tried to ensure that we've got those things in place as well and we will continue to to do that and so the most recent thing and this is slightly slightly different but it's on a similar theme we've just um again released additional resource because of what we regard as the heightened mental health related issues both within students and indeed I have to say staff additional resource to try and manage some of the additional mental health issues that are undoubtedly occurring you know and, and, and I see it I see it across the board and we really need to be very cognizant of it I mean it, it, there are some other very strange things what I know is people are managing under great deals of pressure and I do include this is people as general in our community whether they be staff or students and what I'm conscious of is that if I if I kind of view you that's almost full full of stuff and you pour a cup of water into that bucket and stuff starts overflowing it's quite understandable that people are get um, very emotional and can be having great challenges in those circumstances. And for me, it's a vitally important area of what we do as a university, and we will continue to do that, and we will continue to work with it. What I can assure you of, as with everything else actually, is central to everything that we're, we're doing. We're, we are um, trying to ensure that we're on top of things, and actually, um, speaking with colleagues um, on virtually a daily basis, I know they are doing the right things um, for our students and indeed for our staff. So I hope that answers uh, in some way that question, Leila. Thank you, Ian. That's great. Um, and of course, at JMSU, we've got a range of um, events, activities, and support mechanisms in place. Of course, uh, <laughs> Leila, I was, you know what, the, the one thing I was going to say was, you know, I, I have to applaud what you've been doing as a student union on that front as well, because, you know, I also know you've worked really well in partnership with the university and actually that's really important to us. And I do believe in this is, is actually us continuing to talk and have conversations is just so important. And if we ever stop doing that, 
or if I, as the vice chancellor or as Ian, stop having conversations um, with whoever it is, then we are dead in the water as a university. But what I know is that we've got a great community. And when I say community, that is both staff and students. And yeah, we do get it wrong. And actually, what we do try and do, though, is when we see that we've made a mistake, we try to turn it around as quickly as we possibly can. And I will continue to do that in my role. Thank you, Ian. And I think we reflect upon the no detriment policy when it came to that. As soon as um, the Students' Union had sight of that, we managed to kind of feed that back to the university and there was um, a turnaround on that. So yeah, um, please do keep sharing your feedback and concerns with us and we'll do our best to, to turn things around where we can. Um, and, and I think, Leila, that's it's really important because actually the challenge that we get from you and the team, no matter what it's on, is actually, there's always something in it, always. And actually what we do, I hope you feel, um, and this has very much been my style wherever I've been, is we uh, insist on people listening to what is being said. So not paying lip service to it, and the, and the, and the I would nearly said reciprocal mentoring. <laughs> the no detriment policy is one example of that, of actually where you had a huge impact. And if it had not have been for you, and had not been the challenge that you've put to the university, and I have to say, Claire Milson and Phil, listening to what was being said, I'm not sure we'd have got to the same place, but I think I really do think we got to a great place, and it was a result of your intervention that we achieved that. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, and yes, thank you to Claire and uh, Phil for that. I mean, they're not in the call, but I would like to just... Um, Say thank you to them, I guess. Um, so we have a live question we want to squeeze in here. Um, Amy McNay, um, are you there? I am, yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ian. Hi, Amy. How are you? Not bad, thanks. So? Uh, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what it is, it's pretty much a double-edged sword, this. Um, so... I was lucky enough to be um, voted in as my course rep and then I got a position um, with the two interviews with the student union to be the faculty of science rep, um, which I love. And I've come across the fact that engagement is pretty poor from students. Um, I'm not sure if that's university wide, but it most definitely is on my course. Um, and those people who are given 150% and doing everything that they can to better themselves are finding that the live workshops and live sessions over, over Zoom are becoming pretty pointless to attend because of um, questions that are being asked. And it's not that they're not valid, it's that students are openly, openly admitting, oh, I didn't do the recorded lecture, so I'm going to that live lecture to ask loads of questions that were covered in the, in the pre-recorded. Now, I was, obviously this is going to become evident when they get their grades, you know, they're not going to achieve as well as they could because they've not engaged as much, but for particularly mature students like myself, um it's it's becoming it's upsetting it's boring and you feel like you're not validated because you've done work and still have questions whereas someone who hasn't done a tap has rocked up to a workshop and took the hour and a half we do have with direct access access to the tutor um so amy um I re well, firstly, thank you for making that point. Um, the so my I think what I would say is that clearly, um, if students aren't engaging, that we've we've got an issue as an institution. Mm -hmm. um, what we hope, though, is obviously students have you know decided to come on a program, and we hope they will engage with every activity because we regard them as all of importance yeah. but i do recognize i absolutely recognize what you're saying that it's frustrating for you in the sense that actually well you've done you've been to the um 
pre-recorded lecture or whatever it might be you're then in the live session and but other people are interfering with the experience that you're happening yeah. um, and so for me i think i i need to take that away and reflect upon it i mean the what i have seen um work um in some faculties has been actually the engagement from tutors to link to those students who are not engaging with mm -hmm. some of the material we now have so that might be a way to do it i've not explained myself very well but we now have you know we're aware we're conscious of who's not attending if that yeah. makes sense to yeah. you and so what we're able to do is intervene much earlier in order to say hey come on this is yeah. affecting others within your group or within the session that you're going to and it's unfair on the rest of the student body and that's certainly something we've we've um we can do yeah and uh, that might be the way to address some of your concerns mm -hmm. and and um uh, but i'm i mean what you've said concerns me and um, secondly what we do have is information around students who aren't necessarily engaging with the little the different parts of yeah. a um if you like a module overall on canvas mm -hmm. etc and so we can we can um we can make some inroads on that i think so so i the other thing i would say and i don't know if this is something that is is happening but there was certainly a point in time where um some students were playing back to me they were concerned with them when they were in a session like this where um people weren't making themselves visible now i don't know whether that's an issue for students mm -hmm. or whether that's changed since the start of the semester that's just me playing something back that was coming to me i suppose a month ago but um yeah. you may have a view on that anyway i'll i'll stop there does that make sense to you amy it does, yeah. And I'd also just like to add, though, if that wasn't a dig at the lecturers, um, I myself um, am a full-time mum as well as a full-time student, yeah. and I'm also classed as disabled. And I can assure you now, if it wasn't for the help that I'd received from both the student union, so like Leela and Clarissa, and as well as my module leaders, I would not still be at university. I wouldn't. Well... Amy, can I can I thank you for that that comment? You can probably imagine I'm not the sort of character who gets lots of things that are massively positive, which which is you know completely understandable given the role role that I, I'm in. But that's great to hear because let me tell you why. Um, I, I I've had the pleasure of working at, at several different institutions, but for me, the way Liverpool John Moore's University community operates. Um, is absolutely fantastic and the yeah. support that I feel that our staff both academic and professional services staff support staff give is is incredible yeah. um, and, and I'm, I'm just grateful for you saying that because it at least gives me some some heart about okay some of the things that we are doing are having a positive impact on you Amy yeah. and, and that's that's important you know, it's having more of an it's having an impact on more people than just me but i think people too often use platforms like this to just bring up the negatives and it's not all right it's hard it's hard for all of us we never imagined we'd be in this situation but there are a lot of people like me that are truly grateful and are really enjoying the time and the support that they're getting and and we do recognize that the, the tutors are working the butts off to try and adjust and we do and it is appreciated so thank you uh, thank you amy and i'm i'm extraordinarily grateful for your comments and thank you for being part of our fantastic ljmu community thank you so much amy for that that's really kind we'll pass on um your nice words over to clarissa as well um so we will jump on to another live question um i believe we have a question from uh, another Amy, Amy Jose. Um, I think we've invited you to speak whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear Hi, me? Amy. Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm a course rep for first year students. Yep. And I'm just wondering if there's been any uh, talks around how to introduce students 
who haven't had a true on-campus experience yet into the university life without necessarily having like freshers and introductory lectures to fall back on? Um, so certainly, well, uh, I, let me see if I answer this in an appropriate way. Certainly what I, I, I absolutely agree with you about is this has been a very different start to an academic year than any other uh, due to the global pandemic. Um, and I know, and I think I, I said at the start is, uh, in terms of that freshers week, I felt what JMSU did in terms of from their induction and everything that occurred, even though it was online, was uh, really good. Um, and actually I had a lot of positive uh, feedback relating to that. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is certainly on all of the um, programs across all of the faculties, whilst the, um, it wasn't the usual induction, my understanding and hope is that you did have some sort of induction into the university. But I, what I understand you, I think I understand what you're saying is that when we get back to some sort of normality, will there be the opportunity to um, have some sort of induction that allows you to engage with the university in an effective way that is more normal to what you would have come into had the experience been uh, the same as previous years. Have I got that right? Yeah, um, Freshers was amazing by the way, I will say. This year it was absolutely brilliant for what you could deliver with online. But yeah, it's, it's just with the on-campus experiences and stuff and getting used to actually being in university and stuff yeah. like that. Yes, Amy, I mean, you, the, key, the key for me, um, I make this, this statement and again, you might feel it's a bit of a blase statement, but I do mean it, is as Vice Chancellor, what I desperately want, and you may not believe this, but I desperately want every student who comes to JMU to have a fantastic experience, both within the course and outside the course, right? So that's statement one. I recognize anybody who's come into the first year, this year, it's a different experience. Yeah, there have been, there'll have been some great things, but there have also been some challenges. And actually, for me, what's important is that we induct you when we get back to normal, that may, in a way that you kind of go, okay, this is what, John Moores is really like in normal times and so from my perspective it's really important that we do do that and find a way of doing it whenever that may occur so I hope that reassures you in, in what I'm saying it's certainly something again that I, I will take away and ensure that we is on our radar for when we do get back to a situation where we're able to have some sort of normality so you feel at home within um, within Liverpool within the within the university, so that you have just as enjoyable experience. I do recognise, by the way, some some students are having a great experience. I really do, you know, um, because it's good to get that played back as well. So thanks for that, Amy. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to the students who are still submitting questions. We're trying to come around to you as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to do... Um... Well, if we, Leila, if we don't get round to the questions, can I just say I'm very keen, although I'm not looking at the questions, I'm very keen to take those questions and comments away so that we can then work with them to provide some sort of response to um, what's coming through, if that makes sense. Whether it's every question or grouped, Whatever makes the most sense, I guess, would be the way we'd play it. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Um, so we have a question from Samantha Smith. Uh, whenever you're ready, um, Samantha. Hello. Hello. Hi, Samantha. How are you? I'm grand, thank you. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm good. I'm enjoying talking to you all, yeah. Uh, my question was just about the no detriment policy for this year because I've spoken to a couple of staff about like the possibility of it being on again for this year and a couple of them have said it won't be because students expected the conditions that we were going to be coming into rather than like the complete disruption we had at the end of last term but I, 
myself and a lot of other students feel like this term has still been as turbulent as last term was with like the change from practicals becoming online because some people have got sick the fact that lots of students got locked in accommodation for quite a while and couldn't do anything the fact that we're in lockdown 2.0 lots of things keep changing and I feel like there should be at least some accommodation for the fact that students are struggling and might not be able to achieve as much as they would have done in normal circumstances yeah okay so the the honest answer to that is i actually which you might think surely you know that i don't know the answer so um you're quite right in terms of the no detriment policy uh, did operate last year as as, as leila um mentioned earlier on um, what I, I do know is there was a discussion going on around that as to whether actually we run with a no detriment policy or indeed whether we take into account individual student circumstances. Um, and I think that's a live debate. So I don't, I'm not sure that we've reached a final outcome on that, Samantha. I don't know, but, but that's, that's the honest answer. I'd have to come back to you on that. Yeah, that's fine. Just wondering because there's lots of people who are assuming that it's not on and feel terrible because we've had a lot of coursework and like things going on this year that people have been like if I don't do as well it's going to affect everything because like I'm a third year and a lot of my third year students are panicking over how yeah. this year is going to be affected. Yeah, I, I do know we're in a better position this time to understand individual student circumstances. I know that bit, um, so, so, but what I don't know, and that, that's what, guess what I'm saying, is I don't know whether we have agreed to go with a no detriment policy or whether we go with something that's different that um, hopefully will also make sense to the student body. But I absolutely understand and get the point that you've just made in such an eloquent way. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And if I may add as well, we are constantly in conversation with the Teaching Learning Academy and the um, Academic Reg Registrar posing the same question around the no detriment policy and what support mechanisms will be in place for students with assessments. I have been reassured that there will be an update on that very soon. Um, but I'm, I'm not too sure when, um, but that's from the conversations I've heard. Yeah, at least. Okay, um, so that, that bit, Leila, that, that where I said the conversation's still ongoing is accurate. I'm not so far off the pace that um, I don't know what's happening in the university. <laughs> no, yeah, correct. So, but basically what you're saying is there is a conversation that's ongoing within the Teaching and Learning Academy and they're having conversations with you as well. Yeah, yeah. We just okay. met with Claire on Friday um, who gave us a little update. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. An update soon. Thank you. Um Thank you. so we have had a couple of um live questions come in, but also a previous question. So um there's a question around kind of what will semester two look like? Um, do we know? Um is there any indication of whether it'll be online, whether there'll be active blended learning or um any other approach? Could you maybe talk us through any plans for next semester? Yeah, I can, but I think I've got to put a caveat on this <laughs> in that um, I, I kind of said um, we, as a, me as the Vice Chancellor and the senior team, are working with everything on a daily basis, so things change so quickly. So if I give you an example, today I think scientists said the advice that they gave uh, back in March might not have been the right advice and so you have to, what I'm saying to you is that you have things changing that then can impact on th things so if you then take oh the fact that Liverpool had high infection rates and we had to go into tier three and then into lockdown was something that actually you go okay let's work with that so anything that I say in relation to, ses to semester two I think has to have a health warning associated with it. I mean, our ideal is to um, be back at tier one and face to face. Whether that is reality, we actually don't know because we don't know what the government will say. So we don't know what's going to happen 
yes, there's that window where students will return home for Christmas. What we don't know at that point is whether um, the government will decide more lockdown or not. We don't know what we think is going to happen is they're going to encourage students to come back to university and hopefully will be in a more, um, uh, what's the word, a, a situation that feels better. But if you take as an example, the fact that the vaccine um, situation seems to be coming more positive, but it won't be impactful until later in the year, what might that do to the government's thinking, we don't know. We've also, all the way along, followed public health advice and, um, and tried to be aligned with what the other universities in Liverpool are doing. And, we will con and we're continually in regular contact with the University of Liverpool. I'm in contact with the Vice-Chancellor at, at the University of Liverpool, Janet, and also um, at, at Liverpool Hope Gerald, and we're, we're having regular conversations about that. Um, our ideal would be to get back to normal as quickly as possible. Whether we're able to do so, we don't know. Uh, and it would be, um, I think it would be irresponsible of me to say, yeah, that's definitely what's going to happen when I don't really know at this moment in time. We're continually talking about it. And next week, you know, we are going to put out some communications next week to try to ensure that we provide clarity to students when we're a bit clearer as to what's going on. Um, I know that sounds a garbled answer, but that's the reality of the situation.